I would like to introduce, you know, Rob Watson, who is the founding father of the LEAD standard and now the SWEEP standard, um, who will be speaking at the end after Stan's presentation today and talk about how this new technology uh, really will enable uh, the goals of SWEEP moving forward. And we have Stan Chen. Stan is a leader in the recycling industry. He serves both as the CEO of Recycle Glow Inc., a recycling technology and service provider, and president of United Metal Recycling, a full service class A permitted recycling facility that handles all grades of ferrous and non-ferrous material, source separated plastics and fibers using state-of-the-art processing equipment. As an eco entrepreneur, Stan's passion for sustainability, along with 20 plus years of experience in the recycling industry, has provided the knowledge needed to design and develop ever innovative solutions for the recycling industry, the economy, and the environment. We're really thrilled to have you with us here today, Stan. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Jill. I'm uh, very thankful to be here. Uh, thank you, Rob. Welcome, everyone, um, to the Earth Day special focused around uh, climate change, the plastics industry, and how we can use blockchain to try to fix the problem with uh, by tracking recycled plastic. If so, some of you might know, I was actually trained by what's called the Climate Reality Leadership Project, which was a project by uh, Al Gore that uh, essentially trains people to uh, just talk about climate change and uh, you know what's going on in our world. Um, so this is actually uh, part of the slide deck is called the truth in 10. And we're gonna start with it right now. Uh, this picture is called the blue marble. It's probably the most published photograph in all of history and shows our beautiful home planet. It was actually taken, it's a photo of earth taken by Apollo 17, which is basically a, the last time the crew traveled towards the moon in uh, December 7th of 1972. Um, so in terms of climate change, there are three questions we really have to ask. Must we change? Can we change? And will we change? The first question, must we change, is one that requires a little explanation about what, climate, uh, what the climate crisis is all, is all about. This is a picture of the horizon of the Earth, and it illustrates how thin the sky is. Um, it's really, really thin, and it's a picture of the troposphere and the stratosphere, and we're treating it as an open sewer. Uh, it's a problem because when sunlight comes in through that layer and warms up the earth, uh, some of the heat that's absorbed is radiated back out to space in the form of infrared radiation. And some of it is trapped by the natural greenhouse layer, which is a good thing. Uh, it keeps temperatures within a healthy boundary here on earth. Uh, but the problem is we're thickening that greenhouse gas layer. Uh, by spewing 152 million tons of man-made heat trapping gas into it every single day. And when the greenhouse gas layer uh, thickens, that traps more of the outgoing infrared. Uh, and where does the, the greenhouse gas pollution come from? Well, it comes from a lot of sources. I'll talk about the main one in a moment. Uh, transportation is a big problem. The thawing of the perm permafrost is now a source the burning of forests, mining, methane from landfills and other sources. And obviously today we're going to be talking about uh, plastics as well. But speaking of plastics, uh, the biggest source by far is our dependence on fossil fuels, uh, which results in all the CO2 being spewed into the sky. You can see that after World War II, it started really shooting up and it's still going up. And as a result, the extra heat that's trapped by the global warming pollution drives temperatures up, by the way, Last year was, uh, they, they calculated 70% likely to be the hottest year ever measured with instruments. I, I'm not sure if the final numbers came in yet. Uh, 19 of the 20 hottest have been since 2001 and the five hottest of all have been in the last five years. Last July, Phoenix and Miami had their hottest months ever. In fact, temperature records have been broken all over the world, including in Australia. Uh, look at the capital of Australia, Canberra, to set its all-time high re temperature record uh, last January. Uh, last April in Africa, Ghana, uh, set its all-time high temperature record. In 2019, Europe had the hottest year on record, and all of these countries set their individual hottest year records. Towards the end of June of last year, 
uh, north of the Arctic Circle in Siberia, it went over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 38 degrees Celsius, probably the hottest temperature north of the Arctic Circle. But if we step back and look at the Earth as a whole and see that 71% of the planet is covered by the ocean, 93% of all that extra heat is being trapped goes into the ocean. And the ocean temperatures are setting a new high temperature record almost every year. And this year, uh, very likely to set a new all time record as well. So when the oceans heat up so much, that means the storms that come over the oceans are getting much stronger because of the warm water feeds, uh, that convection energy and feeds moisture into them as well. So uh, getting two storms hitting the US within days of each other doing a lot of damage. Uh, we saw a tropical storm Laura doing much more damage in the Northern Caribbean. The other thing that happens when oceans heat up so much is it, it disrupts the water supply, uh, water cycle by vastly increasing the amount of water vapor coming off of the oceans. Um, that's the first stage of the water cycle. Then it's carried by atmospheric uh, rivers as water vapor over the land and it's released as a downpour and then works its way back into the sea. This is called the hydrological cycle. Uh, what we're seeing is that much more water is in these storms. In the Philippines uh, last spring, uh, more than half a million people were displaced by the storm. Then towards the end of May, a uh, super cyclone Amphan hit Bangladesh and India in the region of the Delta called uh, Sunderbands, which was really devastating. More than a million people uh, were driven out of this region north towards Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh, and then farther north across the border into India. And when people have to be evacuated during the pandemic, of course, that complicates it a great deal as we're seeing like uh, nowadays. Another really important point made by the Pope and others is that these events have the biggest impact on poor people, uh, poor people and also communities of color. Uh, that's why in the United States, like, you know, as uh, we have the new Poor People's Campaign and the Climate Reality uh, Project has partnered with the new Poor, Poor People's Project. Um, as you know, uh, you look at these big downpours on a global basis, they've been really increasing. They are four times more likely now than they were just a few decades ago. Uh, we get what, call, what the scientists are calling uh, rain bombs now, uh, just enormous downpours. Uh, we had one here. This is a picture of Al Gore's home state of Tennessee not long ago. Uh, they're very common around the country, actually. And by the way, obviously, communities of color, minority communities, and poor people are hit the hardest here in the United States as well. If you look at the 10 counties most vulnerable to flooding and other disasters, they are 81% minority in population. Now, uh, farmers are getting hit. Uh, as well. In uh, 2019, we saw 20 million acres that could not be planted in the Midwest because of the downpours and the flooding. And last summer, there were hurricane four straight line winds that destroyed 30% of the corn crop in Iowa. And these farmers have been going through quite a few numbers of years like this. It's uh, starting to really have a, uh, it's already having a big impact. It's happening to farmers in other regions and people all over the world. In India, as you know, they get a monsoon every year, so in the, but the monsoons are much stronger now. Last year uh, was 50% stronger than normal and a lot of the people were being impacted. In China, 70, uh, 700,000 people had to be evacuated because of this climate-related flood. 100,000 people in Kenya at the end of like uh, last April and the same extra heat that's disrupting the water cycle by putting moisture in the air and causing the downpours is also pu pulling the moisture out of the soil and making the droughts deeper and longer. Last summer, we saw groundwater levels fall very, very low in Europe and the droughts in parts of the Czech Republic, uh, worst drought in like 500 years. Uh, in Chennai, they almost ran out of water completely in 2019. We've seen that in some other cities as well. So uh, the higher temperatures are obviously associated with more fires. Um, last summer, we saw that in California, which was happening as I was receiving my training actually last August. Uh, as you can see, like, you know, photos of the cars and the highway during the evacuation, like it, it, it was uh, 360 wildfires uh, were burning in California during 
uh, when this photo was taken. Hundreds of wildfires are still active in California. I think like, um, uh, you know, basically uh, Napa was really affected. Um, and who can forget about the horrific fires in Australia? Uh, wildlife was basically hurt uh, quite a bit. I saw like, you know, these koala bears with the burned hands. And of course, in the Amazon, uh, man-made fires to clear land for agriculture uh, doesn't last very long because the soils are thin. In Southern Europe, the prime minister of Greece said that uh, climate is having a huge impact on Southern Europe. The reinsurance companies are certainly paying heed because they have to pay out when these disasters strike. And you can see the pattern that they have been following. Uh, it's also melting ice, all right? Here is the unnamed huge glacier in Greenland 85 years ago. Here's what it looks like now. And I'm going to superimpose NASA's measurement on how much the ice has melted. Uh, whoops. So like, you know, uh, in, in, into the sea in Greenland, it's melting much faster than they thought four times faster than they thought actually. So it's basically, it's, uh, it's coming from a so-called permanent ice sheet. Same things happening in Antarctica. In Antarctica, you can see the melting of the ice in Antarctica has accelerated dramatically. Uh, it, it surprised a lot of the ice experts over there. And of course, when this land-based ice mass melts, you see the sea levels rise. Uh, the 10 cities measured by population that are most effective are largely in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and China. But when you look at cities with assets at risk, the number one hardest hit is Miami, Florida, and then Guangzhou, and then New York, uh, New York, Newark. This is a picture of an octopus in the parking garage in Miami because of the sea level rise and what they call sunny day flooding, which is it's when like, you know, in a high tide now floods a lot of areas that was once dry. Uh, I mentioned New, New York City and Newark. In New York City, there's almost $130 billion in real estate assets that's at risk. But probably the most vulnerable are the people who live in low-lying uh, islands, like uh, Kiribati here, uh, where they've already purchased land in another country, so their pollution uh, population can be relocated as the sea takes over. It's also a national security issue. The U.S. Defense Department for many years has warned us about food and water shortages, pandemic disease, and refugee flows caused by climate crisis. And as we saw this happen after the historic drought in Syria and other factors led out, uh, led to the out migration of refugees from Syria to neighboring countries, and then across the Mediterranean to Europe, where it destabilized the political equilibrium there. The climate crisis is a, also a health emergency, and we're seeing this in extremely harsh impact, not least because of uh, tropical diseases are moving north. Uh, airline travel has a lot to do with this, but the climate conditions are changing and changing where these diseases can take root and become endemic. Uh, and some of the, these diseases come because we're encroaching on previous, uh, previously wild areas where millions of viruses are still located. We haven't encountered them before. Uh, five new infectious diseases uh, are emerging every single year. And, and most of them are diseases that are coming from animals to humans, like this COVID-19 pandemic, like, you know, originated from bats. And then it was uh, mishandled and it spread widely. There's also air pollution that kills 9 million people a year. And when we burn fossil fuels, we create CO2. That is the principal cause of the climate crisis. But at the same time, we see the creation of so-called conventional air pollution that makes people very sick and kills a lot of people. Um, there are multiple studies now that show particular pollution from the burning of fossil fuels is a precondition that lifts the death rate from the COVID-19 pandemic. This enormous study in China shows that. There have been studies in the U.S. that show the same thing uh, and in other countries. We have to focus on the racial injustice that's also seen in the excess death rate for Black Americans from COVID-19. And that's where the excess, uh, excessive poverty, you know, it's because of lack of access to health care, the living conditions, non-zoomable jobs, there are a lot of factors. And we have to obviously, like, you know, factor in these ethical costs as well. Um, it's not only people that are affected by the climate crisis, we're also in danger of losing up to half of the living species uh, with which we shared this earth with in this century, unless we get busy and reduce this population that's causing the temperatures to go up so dramatically. Um, <laughs> actually, if you, excuse me, I love that sound by the way. <laughs> 
And if you add up all these impacts of the climate crisis, you see it's obviously unaffordable. We can't even talk about ocean acidification. Uh, you, you know, it's like there's infrastructure damage. Like, you know, right now, climate change and the cost of carbon is the largest threat to the global economy. So, so must we change? Uh, the obvious answer is clearly yes. The second question is, can we change? Uh, luckily, the answer to that question is also yes. Um, 20 years ago, the best projections for wind energy were that we, we might uh, reach 30 gigawatts by 2010. We've already beat that goal by 22 times over. The exponential curve shown, uh, show, this is the exponential curve of the use of wind energy, very inspiring. And it's even more inspiring when you look at the best projections for solar 18 years ago. By 2010, they estimated that we might be able to add one gigawatt a year. Well, 2010 rolled around, we beat that goal by 17 times over. And last year, uh, we beat that mark by 121 times over. So uh, it's, it's been great. The exponential curve is even steeper for uh, uh, solar and it's uh, going up even faster. It's because the cost of these technologies is coming down so quickly, like, you know, it's like uh, computer chips as well. Here's an example of the effect that it's having on Chile. Uh, there are all these solar panels they have under construction now and, approve, and they're approved for construction to begin. So obviously this is a breakout uh, as with any, many regions in the world, we are seeing this pattern and it's very, very inspiring and there's cause for hope. Uh, we're not going to run out of solar energy, obviously. We get as much in one hour as the entire global economy uses in a full year. Uh, we're seeing battery storage improve. Uh, future projects, this is the new trillion dollar industry. We're also seeing electric vehicles begin to displace the internal combustion engine. The exponential curve on that is getting very, very exciting as well. So can we change? Uh, yes, we can. Uh, we've got what we need. Uh, question is like, you know, the important question is, will we change? And that's the main reason why we're here. We have a lot going for us. Uh, we just obviously re-entered the Paris Agreement. We're really excited about that. More needs to happen because the fifth year anniversary of last year, every nation is being called upon to increase their ambition and charter course towards even steeper emission reductions. So uh, the pandemic last year definitely caused a delay of one year, but basically this year where everybody's meeting in Glasgow, Scotland, uh, this October, and we, we're going to review and get back to uh, Paris agreements and uh, just renew our efforts. So um, business and investment communities are really taking a look at the fact that fossil fuels are not a common, uh, very good investment anymore. Lots of them are divesting in order to stop losing money on fossil fuels. Uh, that's a very, very good thing. We're also seeing like uh, state governments uh, taking the lead and many of them are moving faster than required by the Paris Agreement. We're seeing a lot of cities take the lead on this also. Like I'm um, uh, from New York, uh, New Jersey, this area, very proud that like, you know, uh, we, New Jersey where I'm working, New York, uh, you know, is really stepping up as well on that. Uh, invest in terms of investors, uh, we're seeing like a lot of companies committed to like really thinking about climate change and thinking about like, you know, renewable energy as well. But today uh, we're talking about like, you know, how climate change affects like uh, plastics and uh, the plastics industry. Well, like, it, you know, one thing that I want to point out, is especially like, you know, when we talk about plastics and plastics pollution is like, you know, how it ties into climate change, right? Uh, just a couple of numbers I want to throw at you, uh, out at you. 8% of the annual global oil consumption um, is associated with plastics, and that's forecasted to increase by 20% of oil consumption by 2050. In fact, in the U.S. alone, actually, like 14% of our oil consumption is for plastic, and it's forecasted to increase to 50% by 2050. So the extraction and transportation of these fossil fuels is very, very carbon intensive. Um, it's estimated 12.5 to 13 and a half million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents are emitted every year just from an extracting and transporting natural gas to feed stock for uh, plastics production. Greenhouse gas emissions associated with extraction can also basically like, you know, we can also talk about the land disturbances in terms of clearing land to build a pipeline. 
and estimated like, you know, because of 19.2 million acres have been cleared for oil and gas development, it's an estimated that we lost like 1.686 billion metric tons of uh, carbon dioxide that are like, you know, extra like is being released because of like the deforestation. So these figures really, really add up in terms of like, you know, uh, like uh, the gas and the oil and plastics industry. Plastics refining is also greenhouse uh, gas intensive. In 2015, emissions from manufacturing ethylene, the building block of polyethylene plastics, was 184 to 213 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is about like, you know, 45 million passenger vehicles emitted during one year. All right. So obviously, like, you know, this is like the plastics industry, the fossil fuel industry has a very large impact on climate change. But we can also talk about the fact like, you know, today I also want to touch upon the fact that the plastics industry, especially in the U.S., is affected by climate change. I mean, 40% of the, the U.S.'s production capacity when it comes to fossil fuels is based in what's called like, you know, the plastics corridor, like, you know, the Gulf of Mexico. This is like, you know, the Louisiana, Houston, like Port of Houston, all that kind of stuff. Um, this is like, you know, a, a picture of the sea surge hurricane risks from like, you know, basically uh, potentially stranded fossil fuel slash plastics production assets uh, from climate change. This is the risk. Um, this picture shows the risk of all of the assets that are at risk from sea level change. Um, so this is uh, this is a two way street. Not only like is the fossil fuel uh, industry like affected by cli uh, uh, affecting climate change, but it is actually going to be affected by climate change in a big way over the next coming decades. So um, so what can we do about this? Like you know, this is where recycle gold comes in. Like we're, we're like uh, we need to really shift from a linear to a circular, like uh, essentially like a business model. Like I think. The time of like uh, traditional business models at this point are broken, right? Um, we need to shift from like, you know, production consumption and disposal to basically, you know, really uh, reuse, recycle, like, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle, right? Uh, the three R's. So how does like, you know, um, how does the blockchain come into this piece? Well, blockchain is actually one of the tools that we can use to really optimize supply chains in terms of taking raw materials and like bringing it back to the customers, turning it into product and turning it into customers and really understanding the supply chain and optimizing. How do we do that? Well, basically blockchain, what it does is it tracks the materials. Like, you know, it signs a digital identity uh, to the materials and like, you know, it really records it like, you know, uh, and verifies the transactions through what's called a consensus algorithm and records it like using cryptography onto a distributed ledger. Um, uh, by doing that, basically, we have an immutable ledger that can't be changed that really records like, you know, any kind of activity, especially when it comes to supply chain activity tracking and like, and, and in our case, sustainable supply chain act, uh, activity tracking. So what we've done in terms of recycling uh, blockchain is we've assigned uh, a digital identity to the plastics, uh, our use case uh, that we've been piloting. Um, our, uh, our initial use cases are going to be focused on around plastics in terms of tracking the materials. Like uh, we assign a digital identity to the plastics themselves as they're being collected, track it as it's being like processed and turned back into recycled like plastics. By using like, you know, basically by assigning a digital identity and blockchain activity to the plastics as they're being recycled, we really like, you know, essentially add value to the recycled plastics themselves. And we provide the data that incentivizes corporations to use recycled plastics because of the additional data that's attached to it versus virgin plastics. So we provide an incentivization mechanism um, for them to really uh, start to diverting away from fossil fuel based resources. Uh, one of the activations that we're kicking off this year is we're going to be tracking ghost nets. Like, you know, I am an environmentalist, um, ocean conservationist, like, you know, um, aspiring surfer, actually. So, like, you know, one of the things that we're going to be tracking is, like, ghost nets. Uh, it's it's uh, it, it, a large number of the uh, plastics pollution that is in the world's oceans are from discarded fish nets. So one of our projects is going to be tracking ghost nets as it's being like collected and recycled back into nylon pellets. And hopefully as it's going, it's uh, making its way into apparel. 
So this uh, slide shows the digital flow and the blockchain flow uh, as the material uh, is going through the supply chain. And as you can see, the digital flow, it, a, a new QR code is generated for the different type of material as it's being produced from each stakeholder. And then basically as that's happening, the blockchain flow, um, each layer of additional information is essentially attached to the blockchain as we're moving forward. Uh, another activation that we're kicking off actually this week is a project from WeCyclers as we're tracking uh, through our blockchain the plastic bottles as they're being collected and recycled into plastic pellets, uh, actually uh, failed plastics in our initial pilot project. So, um, uh, you know, uh, this is basically what we're doing to make a difference. Uh, what we're, we're using data, uh, we're doing using blockchain to track plastics, to track recycling activity, to try to make a difference in terms of like making an impact in, uh, with climate change. So I ask you to join us uh, using their voices and casting their votes and using their choices in the marketplace to fight for the future. So buy recycled products. Um, if you see in the future, in the next uh, few years, or recycle go like, you know, QR codes on like the products that you're buying, please like, you know, make a choice to purchase those kind of materials. Use your voice, uh, use your vote, use your choices and speak the truth and power like your world depends on it. Um, because guess what? Uh, your world depends on it. So thank you very much. That is my uh, Earth Day special climate, uh, uh, climate, uh, change and um, recyclable blockchain implementation. So please scan the QR code, please follow us and join us for a circular and sustainable future. Thank you very much. And I am, uh, I'm going to hold that screen up a little bit so people can scan, but like, you know, I will pass it on to our lovely moderator, Jill from Green Education, who is going to be speaking, uh, who is going to be introducing Rob Watson, who is, I'm uh, sitting on the governance committee of the sweep uh, standard, which is by the father of the lead standard. So I will pass it to you, Joe. Great. Thank you so much, Stan. That was a uh, very useful uh, presentation. We do have a couple of questions if you want to field those uh, while Rob is getting set up here. Um, the first is, uh, can blockchain be used as an improved way to track the amount of waste that we generate? Absolutely. Yes. Like, you know, as long as we can uh, just really provide a digital identity to the material and to record that information. Absolutely. Uh, we have a use case that we're going to be kicking off where we're tracking recycled fibers, like, you know, recycled textiles as it's being uh, uh, recycled and turned back into apparel. Um, so uh, we do uh, envision a look in terms of our blockchain. Uh, where we envision a future where we're going to be using it to really understand carbon impact of our, our activity and be able to understand our carbon offset. And in, in that line, especially like, you know, in, in terms of individual consumers, uh, we really want to understand composting and track that activity on our blockchain as well. Uh, because look, you know, uh, basically food waste is a very huge contributor to GHG as well. So, uh, yeah. Great. We do have a few more questions, uh, but I think we're going to let Rob speak and then we will uh, bring you back uh, at the end to, to cover the additional questions. Uh, Rob, are you ready? Yes, give me one second, Jill. I was, I was actually so engrossed in uh, Stan's uh, responses. Why don't you just give Stan one more question? Because I think right. it's, 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 it'll be good to you know, get on the blockchain thing while it's still sort of fresh in people's minds? Great. Uh, okay, well, we can give you a couple more questions, Stan. Uh, is the ultimate goal for every product sold to have a QR code that consumers can scan and get the entire history of, uh, to, to trace it all the way back up the supply chain? Well, yeah, I, I think like one of the goals of this, like, you know, our, the reason we built the blockchain is number one, provide an incentivization mechanisms for the true, like, you know, like egregious, like offenders, like the petrochemical industry to participate in terms of like using recycled feedstock and like, you know, really making a, a change. But the other goal, obviously one of our other goals is to like, you know, 
allow you to participate, allow the regular business or the, the individuals to actually make an impact. Um, the blockchain allows you to directly engage. Like, you know, imagine going to the store and scanning the QR code of the, the, uh, the, uh, the clothing, like, or the bag that you're buying, right? And be able to thank the fishermen uh, who actually collected that net that went into the, uh, the nylon that went into your bag. I mean, that kind of direct consumer engagement is only possible with blockchain, but I think it's extremely exciting. But yes, that's absolutely one of the goals. Okay, one final question. Uh, is RecycleGo doing any market research on whether people are actually using the QR codes? Well, look, uh, it's this is, uh, it, we are going to be, uh, but it is such a burgeoning and new, uh, look, I mean, we're, we're, we're going into uncharted waters at this point. Uh, what I know is that uh, when I started building RecycleGo and the blockchain and this app company is the world needs a solution. Um, and that's kind of been my guiding, like, you know, my North Star. Um, and I do believe the market research will back it up, but right now we're too early in the market to actually have that data. Great. Well, thank you. I know we're going to have more questions towards the end uh, for you here. I'd like to welcome uh, Rob Watson, the founder and president of Sweep. Uh, I think most people who've, uh, who've been attending our webinars here probably are pretty familiar with you, Rob. Uh, but we know that you have led the, the lead and the green building, and now you're leading us out of this uh, wasteful mess that we're in. So I'm going to turn it over to you and talk about how uh, blockchain and everything that Stan just shared relates to what's going on in the Sweep world. Thanks so much, Jill. And Stan, thank you so much for an inspiring presentation on Earth Day. Uh, this is this climate emergency uh, you know, continues to grow and the work that we're doing and the work that you're doing in uh, sustainable materials management. And, and in fact, everybody on uh, this webinar is doing really, really important work to help solving uh, this most pressing of problems for humanity. Uh, so in terms of how Sweep and blockchain work together, uh, you know, one of the key drivers of Sweep is, is building uh, a market transformation framework. And, and a key element of that market transformation framework is building markets for recycling materials. Uh, and as Stan noted through the, the QR code on the consumer side, um, this will allow us to, to sort of track the provenance of, of materials and components of, of products so that, that consumers can make uh, an intelligent choice. Um, but also on the back end with uh, through um, activities such as the European uh, Holy Grail process, uh, we'll also in the MRF and stuff like that through uh, uh, digital watermarks and, and optical readers, uh, be able to understand, uh, you know, what products are being uh, either recycled or, or disposed of, depending upon, you know, what kind of system you're using. So, um, you know, the blockchain is going to enable us to really close the loop on the whole uh, materials management cycle. You know, things like Sweep, which are focused on uh, certifying local governments and certifying waste management companies, you know, they shine a bright light on sort of half of the uh, materials management uh, circle. Uh, but, you know, once, uh, so from from the, the, the moment that a consumer or a business sets uh, a bin out on the street to be collected, uh, all the way up to the factory gate, you know, sweep and cover most of that. But once it hits the factory gate, gets turned back into a new product, and then, and then the whole use cycle, that's something that we can't penetrate, uh, at least with a standard like Sweep. Uh, and, but, but um, you know, blockchain uh, will enable us to get some light um, and, and understanding of that back end. So it's, it's, a, it's a very important development, um, and we certainly applaud uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and visionaries like Stan uh, who can help us understand uh, the, the potential for that. And so, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, market transformation is, is regulatory push and market pull. Uh, sweep being a voluntary standard is on the market pull uh, aspect of this. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is incentivize and reward and identify leadership and, and reward that leadership. Uh, and so that's um, what, you know, one of the things that blockchain can help do is, is identify and track uh, the leaders and uh, further incentivize sustainable practices across the industry um, and the ability to uh, track real-time supply chain data 
uh, makes the verification process a lot more timely uh, and reduces lags. Um, if anybody has played the beer game in uh, uh, school where uh, it sort of shows the impact of um, you know, supply chain disruptions on uh, you know, beer distribution, um, they can understand how uh, these lags can, can really uh, uh, make very, very difficult uh, responses within the supply chain um, if, you, if you're not managing them properly. And so, uh, you know, based on uh, the factors about, you know, providing transparency, providing uh, a window into uh, applications of recycling and tracking the materials, uh, we uh, estimate that blockchain applications can contribute uh, at least to one prerequisite and up to 36 points uh, towards certification, making it a very influential and important element uh, to a, a sustainable materials management uh, program for a municipality or a, a, a waste management company. So looking at the comprehensive sustainable, material, uh, sustainable materials management policy and programs, it's a prerequisite uh, in sweep. And basically what we're looking to do is promote the highest and best use of materials and reduce overall generation of waste through adoption of government or, or corporate policies and programs. And uh, blockchain uh, enables procurement of uh, you know uh, goods and services that are sustainable, which is part of this comprehensive program. Uh, it helps create incentives and tracking of the uh, data in that, which is again part of other uh, required elements of the plan. Uh, so blockchain can can uh, enforce and reinforce many of the elements of of this prerequisite uh, in sweep. Uh, looking at uh, the comprehensive sustainable materials management lifecycle analysis and policy program. Uh, this is a performance element in the policy uh, structure of SWEEP. Um, those of you who are familiar with SWEEP uh, will remember that there are five uh, performance categories in SWEEP and sustainable materials management is one of them. Uh, the next category is waste generation and prevention, which is more of a tracking and analysis category. Um, you know, we sort of all know that you can't manage what you don't measure, uh, but you can't measure what you haven't defined. And that's one of the important things about Sweep. Um, and we'll be able to use blockchain to define and refine uh, many of the definitional elements within sustainable materials management. So you might have recalled that I referred to uh, sort of the circle and, and how uh, sweep uh, can, can cover half of it. So basically everything uh, in the light blue and light green is what sweep focuses on. Uh, and blockchain will give us more uh, transparency and, and windows into the darker green, the lime green and, and the teal uh, um, portions of the uh, material life cycle. So uh, the way um, blockchain would contribute to this uh, area is, uh, again, giving us that ability to look at the whole cycle um, and, and verify that, uh, you know, the, the, the loop is actually being closed. Uh, you know, there, there was a, a funny Dilbert cartoon once upon a time where <clears throat> Dilbert's working at the office and the janitor comes by and Dilbert says, I noticed that you only have one bin when I, while I have two, one for my recycling, one for my garbage. And the janitor goes, look, a UFO. And when Dilbert looks away, he dumps both uh, uh, both uh, receptacles in, into his one trash bin. And, and that's, you know, we're seeing, unfortunately, a lot of that today, some of it driven by economics uh, and, and the collapse of the con uh, conventional recycling market. Um, and so hopefully blockchain will help us uh, identify new markets uh, and, and be able to track uh, not only the origin, but also the destination uh, of materials as they work their way through the supply chain. Uh, moving on to the materials processing infrastructure and market development policy. Uh, this is, uh, again, another thing that blockchain can help uh, support. Um, you know, we're definitely trying to encourage uh, a new 21st century infrastructure in the U.S. recycling uh, uh, market uh, and eventually overseas. Uh, we think that um, you know, because of transportation and other supply chain issues, you know, we should try and keep things uh, as close to home as possible, uh, creating jobs, creating a circular economy and, and those kinds of um, 
you know, uh, just making the loops closer, uh, closed closer. Uh, and blockchain can help us identify and build a better infrastructure for recovered material uh, by knowing, you know, where they came from and, and where they're going. Uh, and uh, you know, for the compact supply chain uh, credit, um, that uh, is another area where blockchain can very much help. Uh, we uh, look at how uh, materials are, uh, once they're recovered, where do they end up? Are they being processed close? Are they being processed farther away? How are they getting there? All of this is material that can be tracked uh, in blockchain and very simply uh, encoded into materials um, as they work their way through the supply chain. Uh, looking at the source reduction policy, um, you know, this might be uh, where, you know, something like the, the fishnet recovery project that uh, Stan talked about uh, could be applied where we're looking at uh, waste cleanup, waste prevention, uh, waste reduction, um, and, and how those things, you know, uh, how much material uh, came from uh, avoided materiality in products, how much material came from uh, recovery. Uh, the ability to, you know, quickly uh, track that through uh, a VR code or, or something like that and just simply in, encoding it uh, so that you get chain of custody um, is will, will definitely help uh, uh, support uh, this kind of um, uh, source reduction program. Uh, clearly, uh, regulations have an important role. Uh, one way to look at regulations, though, is uh, if we did it any worse, it would be illegal. And so clearly, uh, if we want progress, it's not going to be achieved through regulation. Uh, the purpose of regulation is to get rid of the worst 20 to 30% in the market. And the purpose of markets and incentives and, and those kinds of methods uh, is to raise the ceiling and improve the performance level. Le, uh, level. Um, and, and these things are not mutually exclusive. These are a both and. Uh, so anybody who says only regulation is the way to go or only markets are the way to go, they're both wrong. Uh, these are both necessary but not sufficient components. And when you add them together, uh, one plus one actually equals three because they can leverage each other and 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 allow things to happen uh, more quickly and and with greater performance. So uh, anything that can encourage uh, you know markets are based on information, uh, the ability to have information at your fingertips, whether you're a consumer or a manufacturer, is vital. Uh, so blockchain again it would be uh, a, a core component of uh, a, a way of improving uh, the performance of market-based waste management uh, programs. Uh, then the uh, waste generation and prevention, looking at uh, reuse and rescue programs. Um, you know, one of the big uh, challenges that we have in SWEEP is, you know, how do you know it actually happened? And so, the, you know, this verification element uh, could be very easily built into Sweep through an app and a QR code and, and a simple blockchain backend uh, showing a chain of custody. So this will be one of the things that we could use to help us uh, track uh, certification and verify that activities actually happened. And then uh, again, when you're uh, purchasing environmentally preferably, preferable products and, and capital items uh, for uh, your business or your local government, uh, the ability to uh, just, you know, put in the QR codes for uh, the products that you purchase enables us, will, would enable us, uh, will, will enable us eventually uh, to very quickly and easily track um, how those material, you know, what, what, what the provenance of those materials is, uh, how energy efficient they are, et cetera. Um, and may allow us to ultimately down the road differentiate between uh, the uh, you know levels of uh, sustainable and environmentally preferable product procurement uh, and and further refine and define uh, what that means. So again, we we're, we're very uh, encouraged about uh, you know the potential for blockchain uh, on the procurement side of things, which you know again leads to markets uh, for recovered materials. And then uh, I mentioned the compact commodity and supply uh, chain piece, uh, not unlike the rescue and reuse 
uh, being able to track loads of materials as they uh, come out of the MRF or from the transfer station uh, and, and on through the supply chain uh, to their ultimate, you know, not unlike package tracking for, you know, uh, the postal service or FedEx, et cetera. Um, and then that way we'll be able uh, to have uh, verified information about where materials started, where they ended, how they got there, uh, which would allow us to evaluate this credit much more, much more easily. Uh, so, you know, sweep is a volunteer effort, just like lead was, uh, we believe that we have the same potential to change the waste management industry, like lead change the building industry. Uh, we urge you to get involved with us. Uh, please visit our website, uh, sweepstandard.org. Uh, become a member of Sweep. Uh, no one of us is as intelligent as all of us, and together we can solve complex problems much better than any of us uh, by ourselves. Uh, we have a, a number of committees that are in formation as uh, the standard is expanding, so there are lots of ability. Uh, there's lots of ability to get in early and have a big impact on this market transforming standard. Um, and uh, we have about a dozen uh, companies and local governments participating uh, in our pilot program. Uh, we're looking to have another couple dozen of pilot participants uh, from the local government and private sector side. Uh, if you're interested in being a pilot participant, which basically allows us to hold your hand while we're going through the sweep certification process, uh, please uh, uh, contact us uh, through the website. Um, or uh, just put your um, email in the chat and uh, Sam or Will uh, will we'll get back to you. Uh, you can connect with us on uh, social media in addition to becoming a member and participating in uh, the uh, committees and, and, and helping to grow our organization. Uh, we are now a, an official 501c3, so your membership dues is fully tax deductible. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, please send it to info at sweepstandard.org. And we're really looking forward to working with you um, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Um, and I, I think there were a ton of questions for Sam, uh, I mean, for uh, Stan. So let's, you know, I'd love to finish those up because there were some, there were some good questions and, and uh, you know, uh, Stan is one of the uh, blockchain experts out there. So we should definitely uh, take advantage of him while we have him. Great. That's, uh, this question here, I think, is really for both of you. You addressed it a little bit uh, in your discussion, Rob, about the necessity of both markets and regulations. Uh, but maybe, Stan, you can also add in uh, your input. Uh, the question is, will businesses, municipalities, and waste haulers be fined or paid, which one, to ensure that their customers are using the QR code? How do you make them use it? Well, my take on that answer is actually like, um, uh, actually, I I'm going to, I'm going to preface it by really, uh, extending a support for what's called extended producer responsibility programs, EPR programs. And this is the general concept where basically a producer of a product or the packaging is responsible for the cost of the cleanup of it um, after it's consumed. And this is like, you know, um, it, it's um, in terms of costing, like uh, uh, this, these, these kind of things, like um, it's, we really have to understand, especially like, you know, and it needs to be legislated really um, on a municipal or a federal level, like basically who's going to be responsible for the cost um, because there is an environmental cost um, and it's not being factored into the price of the product itself. So blockchain is definitely a way to really uh, like uh, first and foremost, it's a way to track materials and track like basically activity of the product slash packaging but it's also a way, um, if you apply, like, you know, integrate tokenomics into it, like it's also a way to basically apply EPR programs in terms of like, you know, essentially using like a, let, let's call it a token um, as a way to fund like a cleanup ac activity. And when the product actually gets scanned back into like, you know, the uh, back into the recycling supply chain, then those tokens or those credits are released. 
So like, you know, it's a way for basically deposit, like, you know, bottle deposit return programs, like, you know, it's a very easy implementation of like uh, EPR programs um, can be blockchain based and it will actually generate data to show where recycling is not happening and where recycling education needs to be reinforced. Yeah. So, you know, again, the market transformation is a combination of carrots and sticks. Uh, typically, you know, the, the, the sticks will start small and the carrots will start small, particularly when you have a nascent technology. Uh, and then, you know, both of them as, as it gets more widespread, uh, you know, they will sort of leverage off of each other. And, you know, uh, last year's carrot will become this year's stick and, you know, then, then a new carrot will be put out. Um, and, and so, you know, we want to give both positive and negative reinforcement so that we move people towards the sustainable position. Uh, you know, everybody thinks that, you know, governments and economics are, are, are hard masters, but believe me, uh, they are little fluffy bunny marshmallows compared to chemistry, biology, and physics. Uh, so, you know, we'll either learn the hard lessons or, or the, 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 the easy ones. Um, so. The short answer is, you know, wait and see how we figure out how best uh, to integrate this technology. Uh, the goal will be to uh, make improvements and help people make money. Uh, that's, you know, we, that, that's, that's got to be part of it, right? Great. Uh, Rob, will blockchain be explicitly stated in Sweep? Uh, eventually. I do believe so. Um, you know, again, once we understand a little bit more about, you know, what its capabilities are, et cetera, it's a little premature right now to do it. Um, it's probably something that, you know, would end up being, if, if we were to explicitly mention it, it would probably end up in an innovation credit, right? We, we don't want to hang credits out there that are sort of part of the denominator and use up, if you will, the coins of the realm of sweep for things that aren't, you know, real or scaled. Uh, that's just frustrating. Um, but we definitely want to uh, mention it and incentivize it. Uh, so, you know, if we think of something, if somebody has a, a credit that they think might be kind of interesting to put in to sweep, um, you know, give us an idea and, and we'll put it into the uh, innovation or exploration categories. And then that way people can try it out without being penalized with regard to the, the final certification, you know, level. A uh, question from Chris Thompson. Could you expand and easily apply the solid waste focus of sweep to liquid as in wastewater and reclamation? Uh, that's a great question. And, um, you know, we punted a little bit on the biosolid piece of it, mainly because we sort of got to the end of the standard development process and realized, you know, we had put the word biosolid in, but hadn't really thought it through. Um, as we go through the pilot process, uh, we will be looking a lot more about uh, the biosolid management uh, element. And you know, if we do find that there is um, uh, a, a, a strong linkage or, or possibly uh, potential for um, a, a wastewater management standard uh, similar to sweep, uh, maybe we'll call it weep. Uh, I don't know water you know, but um, you know, there 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 certainly is a possibility uh, um, of doing that. And and again, you know, stay tuned for wastewater biosolids as part of that solid waste management uh, handling and and coverage. Uh, we just hadn't done our homework enough on it yet to include it in the system now. But that's something that we should see in a year or so. Great, Chris is uh, suggesting swirl as your new okay. <laughs> Uh, Stan, when did the idea of blockchain uh, become an idea for improving transparency and traceability of the supply chain? Well, blockchain is um, like, you know, blockchain is really started because of Bitcoin in terms of Satoshi Nakamoto's like a uh, uh, seminal white paper in terms of like the Bitcoin blockchain. And um, it, it really, I, I think it really started really right after that, because like, you know, in terms of like uh, taking a transaction, recording the transaction and basically using cryptography to verify the transaction and then basically put it onto a permanent ledger. Um, I, I think very soon after like that was built out and uh, put out into the market, people started saying like, wait a minute, um, 
there is a system to understand what a product is going through all of that, all that's happening, like, you know, GPS time date stamp of the material as it's being handled by each stakeholder in the supply chain. Um, like, wait a minute. Uh, this is great. This is a great tool to understand what's going on with the product as it's traveling through. One of the first use cases of the blockchain was actually with Bumblebee in terms of like, you know, putting the activity from the fishermen sustainably fished, like, you know, sustainably sourced tuna all the way into the camp. Uh, so it's like, wow, you get that level of granularity and information from a blockchain, like with that distributed ledger, with that way to verify that activity and to track it. Uh, you know, in, in the green building world, we, we were looking at, you know, chain of custody issues around sustainable, sustainable wood products, right? So anybody that's done any uh, kind of work in chain of custody types of things, and once they, you know, have a basic understanding of what blockchain can do, uh, it's, it's immediately obvious that this is a really, really good application for that, that whole chain of custody thing. Um, and the other thing that I just wanted to, uh, uh, you know, uh, jump in and, and point out that, you know, a lot of people sort of, a lot of people conflate Bitcoin with, with blockchain and basically say, oh my God, the whole planet is going to be one giant server and, and it's too expensive for energy and stuff like that. And, and blockchain, even though uh, Bitcoin is built on a blockchain platform, the kinds of energy consumption and requirements that we're seeing for Bitcoin will not be present in the kind of blockchain applications that, that Stan's talking about. They're just, just for a whole host of technical reasons, which would you know occupy an entire seminar by themselves, um, just requires a whole different level of computing uh, to, 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 to get to the point of the, the, the level of security that's needed for the kind of transaction tracing that is. So, so we're not, you know, we're not um, killing the planet to save it uh, with, with, with blockchain in this, in this regard. Great. Well, I know we're just up about uh, with the hour. Um, I'd like to see if there's any last minute questions, uh, Will, that you've noticed in the chat that should be addressed. And uh, while we wait for that, I have one final question uh, for Rob and Stan. Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing. A big question, how the focal company can earn profit through blockchain-based business model and who pays for the blockchain implementation costs? Um, I, I can say that basically right now with our pilot project deployments, we're really uh, starting to build the economic models around this. Um, and this is a burgeoning industry. And what we're doing is basically we're creating a, uh, you know, um, I, I like to say when I, when like, you know, I talk about what we've built over at RecycleGo in terms of the recycled blockchain is we're really building a new uh, business model. We're building a new society where we're, we're essentially measuring social impact. We're measuring recycling activity. Um, so we're like, you know, by tracking that, we can now assign a value to that. And there's a value to recycling. There's a societal value to recycling. There's an environmental value to recycling. So based on the fact that we are creating value, there is definitely a business model around it. And we're basically in the beginning innings of like, you know, the future that we're building. Transparency is the watchword for the 21st century um, and, and consumers are demanding it. Uh, you just won't be able to do business, uh, frankly, and, and that's going to be incentive enough to do it. Yeah, look, you know, in terms of ESG, environmental, social and governance, um, like ESG metrics at this point are uh, basically they're a prerequisite for a lot of firms in terms of where they're putting their investment dollars at this point. So it's um, there in terms of like, 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 like you know, blockchain. I, I think that is really in the grand scheme of things, like you know, uh, in terms of different economic and future economic models. Um, I, I have no doubt that there will be a solution, that there is a solution. I think that's a great place to end. Great. Thank you again, Rob, Stan. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be available uh, within the next week, I think both through the SWEEP and the Green Education websites. And I'd like to, to thank Stan, thank Rob, thank Will and John and Sam behind the scenes for answering uh, questions.
and like to, to uh, take some time today to go out right, and guys. enjoy the natural environment that we're all working so hard to protect. All right, before she calls back again, let's get off. <laughs>